Show me a woman who's leading on the run. Show me an angry man who's reaching for his gun. And I'll show you a young wife with so many reasons why. Music, art, dialogue, reflection, and seeking at the House of Peace. Sounds like a big agenda. We welcome you. We expected a small circle of those many people who would know each other, and we are really delighted to have friends that we're only meeting for the first time tonight. Our friends and neighbors that we know well, and our relatives of Paul, who have come all the way from London to join us for this <laughs> evening. We are grateful to Tom Gale, and to Mary Kate, and to Jean Bernhardt, and all the others that have worked to bring this evening together. And we acknowledge that it's Father's Day. And it's significant that we are lighting a candle on Father's Day for, I'd like to limit it to just two reasons. One is that it has the word peace in many, many different languages written on it. And last week, in the Christian churches, this week in the Orthodox Christian churches, today is the day of Pentecost, which is a festival of all religions, of all languages, and all cultures. So it was very significant for John to be able to attend the picnic of the Serbian friends gathered in Watertown today in order to bring a family of six who have been staying at the House of Peace who left Yugoslavia a little less than four weeks ago and will be with us for perhaps another month. And so we think of them on this Father's Day of many languages and many religions and many cultures, aware that they are in the house with their four little children, unable to speak or understand any English, and having everything to do with Juan and the Veterans for Peace and the House of Peace that had tried to convene this circle tonight. Juan would present to us an update on that most horrendous opponent of all fatherhood, taking of lives of women and children in the form of landmines. Mary Kate, after Tom speaks, would offer us a musical reflection. And then I will introduce Julia Ward Howell, who will offer us an incredibly powerful, uplifting, and demanding, compelling call for peace. John then has offered to take this juxtaposition of motherhood, Julia Ward's how proclamation arising from the stream of motherhood, and fatherhood, which we celebrate as deeply as we can on this day, and present to us some leading thoughts having to do with violence and peacemaking from the mother and the father's point of view, the masculine and the feminine. Tonight is an encore performance by Ms. Jane Burkhart, a biblical artist, and it wouldn't be possible if uh, what she did it the first time that she agreed to do it again. And so thank you very much, Jane, and thank you very much, Carrie and John, for uh, opening up the House of Peace tonight uh, for this encore event. Jane has told me that she's going to take this into the schools, which is uh, a very high uh, goal, I think, and we're going to support her on that. 
Also, uh, once you did the performance the first time, it was at the uh, Beverly Unitarian Universalist Church. And the theme uh, there with the uh, North Shore Friends was landmines. And so we're also uh, bringing that tonight. And we have a display in the back from the uh, Band the Landmines program, which started several years back. There is a, a piece in there on uh, landmine survivors. And uh, Jerry White is a survivor. And he created Survivors Network. A month ago we saw his mother, and uh, tonight uh, we have an opportunity to see him and the wonderful work that he's done. And uh, we pose in a, a few questions for those who can stay. They have a website, www.laymines.org, and quite a, uh, a, a website that the United Nations Association USA has put together. And we as the Veterans for Peace and also the Merrimack Valley People for Peace have uh, started with a donation for Adopt the Minefields. And we have a minefield right now in Afghanistan. And I printed out uh, some of the pages on the website. And although we're not called out specifically, uh, there are some groups that uh, might be familiar with. They have, uh, and it's, I've got it on the back wood there. Uh, you can see that there's quite a bit of uh, demining going on around the world. They have estimated that there's between 80 and 100 million landmines out there. It costs three dollars to make and a thousand dollars to remove. And although uh, the United States has not signed the treaty to uh, ban landmines, uh, they have put uh, money towards uh, demining landmines and also the training of uh, foreign personnel as well as uh, U.S. personnel in demining. And so they have removed. Uh, thousands of mines, but we, you can see we have a long way to go. But the UNA has uh, put together this Adopt the Minefield with the idea that to make it more personal. And I expect uh, more information to come from uh, the UNA to tell us about where this minefield is exactly in Afghanistan and the people that live around it. Because it seems that every two, 22 minutes, statistically, a landmine goes off and either uh, kills or maims man, woman, or child. And there are something like 26,000 people that are harmed every year. And I think we really need to try to educate the public about this and uh, to raise money. I think they've uh, said it costs about $25,000 average to clear the market. About 130 years ago, after the carnage of the Civil War in America and the carnage of the Franco-Prussian War in Europe. Women could barely stand the pain of having their motherhood violated by war. One great woman, Julia Ward Howe, who is known for her composition of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, deeply pondered the events that had swirled around her and so imprinted her life. She issued a call for peace, and she took that call to the corners of this country, and it rang throughout Europe. And in London, England, there indeed was a great congress of women for peace. And the first Mother's Day for Peace was celebrated throughout the world, in Rome, in London, in Constantinople, with the deepest possible commitment to make peace. And so we are deeply grateful to Jane's great effort to make real for us this call, which we feel belongs in this room, within this house of peace, within this circle, on this particular night. Jane will speak out 
Julia Ward's Howe's proclamation and follow that by Julia's autobiographical excerpts. Arise then, women of this day. Arise, all women who have hearts. Whether your baptism be that of water or of tears. Say firmly, we shall not have great questions decided by irrelevant agencies. Our husbands shall not come to us reeking of carnage for caresses and applause. Our sons shall not be taken from us to unlearn all that we have been able to teach them of charity, mercy, and patience. We women of one nation will be too tender of those of another to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. From the bosom of the devastated earth, a voice goes up with our own. It says, disarm, disarm. The sword of murder is not the balance of justice. Blood does not wipe out dishonor, nor does violence indicate possession. We women of one nation will be too tender of another to allow our sons to be trained to injure theirs. And so, I call together from womankind throughout the world a great and earnest day of peace, that women might come together and decide together on the great cause of peace. in the name, not of Caesar, but of God. I composed these words as the Franco-Prussian War raged in Europe and the wounds of our own civil war were still so fresh in our hearts and minds. The thought had suddenly presented itself to me why do not the mothers of mankind interfere in these matters to prevent the waste of that human life of which they alone bear and know the cost? And so I resolve to issue an invitation to womankind throughout the world to join together for a conference of peace to be held in London, the great metropolis of the civilized world. For two years, my invitation was translated into many languages. I corresponded with leading women throughout the world. And at last, in 1872, I did travel to London, where I met with many notable individuals and attended many meetings. Indeed, I attended the annual meeting of the English Society for Peace, but when I requested permission to speak, was denied on the ground that women never had addressed these meetings before. Finding but little encouragement for my efforts among existing societies in London, I decided to rent a hall of modest size where I myself might speak on Sunday afternoons. The Freemason Tavern presented an opportunity well suited to my purpose. And so, with the help of a friend, my meeting was properly advertised. On the first Sunday, I betook myself thither, strong 
in the conviction that my cause was just, but uncertain as to its result. Entering Freemason Tavern, I inquired of the doorkeeper whether there was anyone in the hall. Oh yes, a good many, he said, and I entered to find the company quite numerous. It is my recollection that I spoke thus for some five or six Sundays, and the attendance was excellent throughout. Another feature of my peace crusade was my desire to institute a festival to be known as Mother's Day and to be set aside for the advocacy of peace doctrines. I chose for this day the beginning of June when flowers are abundant and the weather often favors open-air meetings. I had considerable success in carrying out this plan. Indeed, we had Mother's Day celebrations for many years throughout the world in Rome, Constantinople, and London, Paris, New York, Boston. My heart was warmed recently to learn that a small peace delegation in Philadelphia still holds its annual Mother's Day celebration. I was sorry to give up this special work, but could not fail to see that many steps were still to be taken before one could hope to institute a worldwide peace crusade among women. Indeed, in many ways in those times, it seemed that the final emancipation and proclamation, the final liberation of the human race seemed close at hand. The great millennium of peace and goodwill seemed upon us, and yet the time for its fulfillment had not yet arrived. Nevertheless, I cherished the hope that with my efforts, I had been able to sow some small seed which might bear fruit thereafter. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your kind attention. A member of a group called, it's a mouthful, the People's Music Network for Songs of Freedom and Struggle. And uh, thanks for that group, I learned some good songs and some songs that have been rewritten to the tune of other songs that have to do with peace and freedom and struggle. And the first time it was fathers, the last time it was sons. And in between your husbands marched away with guns and drums. And you never thought to question, you just went on with your lives. Because all they taught you who to be was mothers, daughters, wives. You can only just remember the tears your mothers shed as they sat and read the papers through the lists and lists of dead. And the gold frames held the photographs that mothers kissed each night. And the door frames held the shocked and silent strangers from the fire. And the first time it was fathers, the last time it was sons. And in between your husbands marched away with guns and drums. And you never thought to question, you just went on with your lives. Because all they taught you who to be was mothers, daughters, wives. It was 21 years later, with children of your own, the trumpet sounded once again, and the soldier boys were gone. So you drove their trucks and made their guns, and tended to their and prayed for safe return. 
And when the war was over, you had to learn again to be just wives and mothers, though you'd done the work <coughs> of men. So you worked to help the needy, and you never trod on toes. And the photos on the pianos struck a happy family pose. The first time it was fathers, the last time it was sons. And in between your children marched your way, your husbands with guns and drums. And you never thought to question, you just went on with your lives. Cause all they taught you who to be was mothers, daughters, <coughs> wives. And your daughters grew to women, your little boys to men. And you prayed that you were dreaming when the call up came again. But you proudly smiled and hid your tears as they bravely waved goodbye. And the photos on the mantelpieces always made you cry. The first time it was fathers, the last time it was sons. And in between your husbands marched away with guns and drums. And you never thought to question, you just went on with your lives. Cause all they taught you who to be was mothers, daughters, wives. And now you're getting older, and in time the photos fade. And in widowhood you sit back and reflect on the parade of the passing of your memories as your daughters change their lives seeing more to our existence. Trying to save existence as mothers, daughters, wives, and Preparing for this evening, we kind of guided by the unusual way in which this Mother's Day for Peace was going to be brought to Father's Day. And Gary had already spoken that we were between Pentecost of the Western Church last Sunday and Pentecost of the Eastern Church this Sunday. And Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit descended upon a group of men and they went out speaking a universal language that was understood by both genders, by all people, regardless of their language, their religion, their culture, or any other division or identity. And there is such a language in existence that is understood by every human being. And that is the language of justice, of nonviolence, of peace, of nurture and support of the good and of resistance to evil. I was with a Muslim group yesterday and we spoke in universal language without the least barrier or obstacle to our understanding despite radically different faith and language and cultural and religious background. The Holy Spirit has a gender that's absolutely clear, and it is feminine. 
she descended upon this group of men. And violence, war, executions, prisons, all forms of intentional, organized, legalized, institutionalized, normalized violence, infliction of intentional harm, on another human being as a gender. And I think it's important that a man identify it, and I'm not that man, I'm only the messenger. But Dr. James Gilligan, in an absolutely groundbreaking book, which I want to share excerpts of tonight, on violence, Identity makes clear, and I suppose we would all know, without a moment's hesitancy, that the gender of violence is male. And what we thought was that here in Pentecost, with the Mother's Day and Father's Day, I might share some of these leading kind of thought that can open something for us personally in our lives and on behalf of the tremendous epidemic of violence uh, in which we are living in the midst of. Part of one of the chapters of James Gilligan's book is how to increase the level of violence, how to increase it, and why. And uh, that's why I recommend this book absolutely as a manifesto for us, because all of these ways, he identifies 12 ways to increase the rate of violence, and we are doing every one of them. We are spending billions of dollars to support and enhance every step of his 12-step program to escalate violence. This Holy Spirit that lets us know that all life is sacred. We commonly acknowledge the Mother Earth and Mother Nature, this, this primacy of, of Mother, uh, the Mother of God, the Mother of Compassion uh, out in the garden, and yet we don't take it seriously. I thought perhaps James Gilligan would help us. So if you'll allow me just to read these passages, and I'm not sure whether it should lead to a dialogue amongst ourselves. I don't want us to impose such a beginning dialogue. But we thought that we might have a series of meetings through the course of the summer to open such a dialogue. All this violence was part of a larger pattern that statistically most lethal violence is committed by men against other men. Violence is primarily men's work. It is carried out more frequently against men, and it is about the maintenance of manhood. To say that is not to minimize men's violence against women, it is rather to take the first step towards understanding the etiology of all violence against both men and women. Of course, the violence against women is all the more shocking because it is of the strong against the weak and the powerful against the defenseless. <clears throat> One of the 12 steps to increase violence is to maximize the polarization and asymmetry of the social roles of men and women. Nothing stimulates crime and nothing stimulates violence more than the division of males and females into the roles of violence object and sex object, respectively. This polarization and asymmetry, uh, of course, is escalating. If the main causes of violence are these social and psychological variables, 
shame versus honor. An apparent anomaly lies in the fact that men are, and always have been, more violent than women throughout history and throughout the world. If shame stimulates violence, if being treated as inferior stimulates shame, and if women have been treated throughout history as inferior to men, then why are women less violent than men? And they are indeed vastly less likely than men are to commit homicide, suicide, war, assault in every culture, in every period of history. The outpouring of scholarship across disciplines on the asymmetrical social roles assigned to males and females by the various cultures and civilizations of the world has included works in history, economics, literary theory, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, psychology, science, law, religious studies, ethnic studies, and women's studies. One thing all this work has made clear to me is that listening to women for the first time and opening up a dialogue between men and women, rather than merely continuing what has throughout most of the history of civilization been primarily a male monologue. is a necessary prerequisite for learning how to transform our civilization into a culture that is compatible with life. That the same relative differences between the two gender roles can be found in many civilizations throughout history and throughout the world emphasizes the importance of understanding that it is men who are expected to be violent, who are honored for doing so, and dishonored and shamed for being unwilling to be violent. A woman's worthiness to be honored or shamed is judged by how well she fills her roles in sexually related activities, especially daughters, mothers, wives. Men are honored for activity, ultimately violent activity. They are dishonored for passivity or pacifism, which renders them vulnerable to the charge of being a non-man, a wimp, a punk. Women are honored for inactivity or passivity and for not engaging in forbidden activities. They are shamed or dishonored if they are active where they should not be, sexually or in realms that are forbidden, professional ambition, aggressiveness, competitiveness, and success or violent activity such as warfare or other forms of murder. Incidentally, this was written in 1999. This is absolutely current. Although some people may feel that something has slightly changed, probably more likely that a great deal has regressed. We cannot think about preventing violence without a radical change in the gender roles to which men and women are subjected. The male gender role generates violence by exposing men to shame if they are not violent and rewarding them with honor when they are. The female gender role also stimulates male violence at the same time that it inhibits female violence. It does this by restricting women to the role of highly unfree sex objects 
and honoring them to the degree that they submit to those roles or shaming them when they rebel. This encourages men to treat women as sex objects and encourages women to conform to that sex role. And it also encourages women and men to treat men as violence objects. And this is the final paragraph. And uh, Dr. Gilligan worked for 25 years as director of mental health in the Massachusetts prison system, working with the most violent men in the state of Massachusetts. So it is on the most medically sound and uh, researched and authoritative basis that he concludes from experience and from analysis that violence is totally, totally preventable. Uh, it is a distortion of our thinking to think that it is inherent or innate or there's always been wars, there always must be wars. It's natural, it's within the male, within humankind. Uh, if it were in any degree natural, it would never have had to subject me or the other veterans in this room uh, to weeks and months of brainwashing and, uh, and domination and intimidation and uh, the stripping of all that we learn from our mothers in order to make us trained professional killers it would not have been necessary. If it were natural to go into combat, then those who had suffered that trauma would come home happy, joyous, bouncing, bubbly men uh, instead of bearing the scars of, of flashbacks and trauma and psychosis and addiction. It violates the human spirit. It's not Johnny comes marching home again and again. It's, it's Johnny got his gun. Now, that's the truth of it. And yet we are caught in this culturally imprisoned uh, roles. So if we can, if we can somehow create something new together, I think it would be we have all the we have all the the dry tinder and wood to strike the fire amongst us. This Holy Spirit will come down and will speak a universal language and a new language to men and women. His last paragraph, the fundamental challenge for our time, I believe, is to break the link between civilization and patriarchy so that we can continue to receive the benefits of the former without having to pay the cost of the latter. If humanity is to evolve beyond the propensity towards violence that now threatens our very survival as a species, then it can only do so by recognizing the extent to which the patriarchal code of honor and shame generates and obligates male violence. If we wish to bring this violence under control, we need to begin by reconstituting what we mean by both masculinity and femininity. We should just take those thoughts in and decide and to carry you to the side. If you tried, if you did, you probably wouldn't be sharing these thoughts tonight if it weren't for the particular group that Veterans for Peace, Samantha Smith chapter, is. The reason I say that is that 
very early on, in the very first days that Paul Brailsford especially had the powerful initiative to form the Samantha Smith chapter, two things came about. One is that at Paul's suggestion, this very special group of veterans selected a child, a little girl, as their patron. And we've heard often of Samantha Smith, but it's the devotion to the peacemaking efforts of a little girl child that's had such an impact on the 10 years of Samantha Smith's work as a chapter of Veterans for Peace. Secondly, Paul, if I remember, as the first and only woman back 10 years ago as we gathered for our forming meetings in the House of Peace living room, during the beginning of the sanctions against Iraq and the build-up toward the Gulf War, Paul said he felt that women were veterans of a different kind and should belong to this group. And so with the broadest interpretation of who is a veteran, Paul invited me to come to join that circle, and since then many women have joined that circle. And we know it's a cause of controversy among some veterans groups to think of women who haven't borne arms but borne children to be named veterans. And so it's from this Paul, for which we are very grateful to you and to all the members of Veterans for Peace in this chapter especially, that we're enabled to ponder with already a fertile ground for the seed of these powerful thoughts John has shared. This polarity which is a mutuality or a coming together out of different destinies of the masculine and feminine longings for peace. So having said that, I'm not quite sure. I know we have a beautiful song that we'll all join in. I know we still have a video that many want to see. And I would need to ask, since our circle includes um, guests who uh, may have not expected that we would carry on a dialogue, I would just say, could we breathe out a moment and just decide whether we shall uh, kind of take what John has given and carry it forward and leave it to a small group to convene us again and proceed with uh, meeting each other more and sharing the video? Or would it be the will of the group to form a circle for no more, I would say, than 15 or 20 minutes uh, reflection on what has been brought so far this evening? Spirit of Samantha moved me and thank you for your kind words. And I think the spirit of Samantha would want us, men and women, to form a circle and carry forward our spirit. Would say that men and women must get together, must realize they have a responsibility to one another, to dialogue in order to find a place where peace lies somewhere in this group and beyond into the world itself. I call the usual quick clarity for this circle and that it would be just for about a quarter of an hour that we introduce ourselves in this circle.